Hi everyone. Oftentimes when people come to the Bible uh, or to an ancient document, um, ancient literary text, they come to it thinking that somehow it was written in a vacuum. That um, somebody sat down and without being affected by anyone or anything, they wrote this text. Um, unfortunately, more fortunately, uh, that's not the case. And these texts were written under the influence, uh, if you if we can call it that, of other texts and other stories and other traditions and other mythologies. And so we always have to look for the influences of other stories and other traditions and how the story that we're reading interacts with other stories. For example, when you come to Genesis 1, um, you can't ignore uh, the other Near Eastern stories that talk about similar types of creations. Um, and the comparisons that you find there s sort of let you know, one, what uh, gives some clue as to what the text is doing, what the story is supposed to do, um, and two, how you can interpret <clears throat> that text uh, in light of the other story. So if you were to find that in Genesis 1 and 2, you have a very similar story in the ancient Near East, um, from around that time that talks about um, another God creating, you might look at the Genesis account and say, well, maybe the writer of this is trying to say, no, it's not this other deity that's creating, it's, it's Yahweh that's doing it. So this <clears throat> sort of interaction between texts is called intertextuality, and it's going to be the um, one of the focal points of today's video um, where we're going to compare two works of Akkadian literature to see how they influence one another. And we use these because the the influence is very clear. It's the same language, um, Akkadian, and so you can see when the same phrases are used in the two texts. And um, it's just a very good example of how one text borrows directly from another text to try to rewrite a story, to, to, to make a different uh, argument. And these two texts are the Anzu myth, which features the god Ninorta, and Enuma Elish, a text that many of you are probably familiar with, which features the god Marduk. So what we're going to do is we're going to, com we're going to summarize the Anzu myth, and we're going to summarize Enuma Elish, and then we're going to compare the two. Now, before we get going, I want to point out that this sort of comparison is not new, particularly between these two texts. Um, Lambert, back in 86, wrote an article, a little eight-page, seven-page article, um, where he shows the um, similarities, the very strong similarities, between the Anzu myth and Enuma Elish. Um, to point out how the later text, Enuma Elish, develops the ideas that are set forth in the Anzu myth um, for a purpose. And so what I'm going to do is, uh, you know, so some of the things that I'll point out, he points out in his article, I'll, I may point out a few additional things, but um, I'll, and I'll link, um, or I'll cite the uh, the text, <clears throat> the, the article, in the description below that you can, so that you can go read it. But let's start off by just sort of going through what these uh, these two texts have uh, in them, and uh, and then we can compare them. So, the Anzu myth basically is the story of Ninorta and how Ninorta overcomes this enemy of the gods. Um, so, uh, to show his great power, uh, and in doing so, as his reward, he is made the supreme you know, the supreme deity, uh, the king of the gods. And the same thing happens in Enuma Elish. Marduk, uh, there's, a, there's, you know, a situation where the gods are all being threatened, and Marduk alone stands up and defeats the threat and is rewarded with giving, being given kingship over the gods. So the Anzu myth features Ninorta, 
and uh, that's the, the basic premise. So the enemy is this bird called the Anzu bird, and um, we'll probably end up doing a, a separate daily data video on him. Very interesting character, and um, he's the, uh, the antagonist in this story. So the text starts off with a praise to Nanorta, and it's set in a mythological pre-organizational creation period. So things have been created, but they haven't really been organized. Um, and in this sort of somewhat chaotic state, the Anzu bird is born. And he's very powerful, and because of this, he's charged by Enlil with guarding the entrance to uh, a, a portion of his temple, Enlil's temple. Now, Enlil is the, the god that holds um, the Tablet of Destinies. And this is definitely something that we should do a daily data on. Very fascinating um, piece of uh, literature that later actually turns into a physical object. Uh, but this Tablet of Destinies is sort of the... It's a tablet, it's a physical tablet that you can pick up. And the person that has it, the individual that has it, can, can command the elements. Right, so if... Um, if the person holding the Tablet of Destinies says, tree be you know, removed from that, from the ground and go up in the air, the tree would have to come out of the ground and go up in the air. So it's a very powerful thing. And um, the person that has it, the individual that has it, really controls the world, um, controls the elements. So Enlil has the Tablet of Destinies. He's the head god. And Anzu wants it. And of course, Anzu is guarding the entranceway to Enlil's cella, and so he starts to plot. How can I, how can I get this uh, tablet of destinies? So, um, one day Enlil is taking a bath, and while he's taking the bath, Anzu runs in, grabs the tablet of destinies, hightails it out of there, and uh, flies into the mountains. Well, <clears throat> Enlil is naturally very upset. And he summons individual gods and, you know, charges them with going out and fighting Anzu and getting the tablet back. And these are fairly minor deities um, that, that, he, uh, that he calls. And each one says, no way, Jose. Um, tablet of Destinies, you can't fight against somebody that has that. You know, I'll get killed if I go out there. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not doing it. Well, Enlil's uh, still upset, obviously, and Ea, the god of wisdom and strategies, uh, comes up with a plan, and he persuades Ninorta's mother, you know, the main the main god of this um, of this story, Ninorta, convinces his mother, Mommy, to convince Ninorta to go and to fight against Anzu, and so she does. And Nort is finally convinced, and he works himself up into a frenzy, goes and gathers all his weapons, and heads out to battle toward Anzu. Well, when he when the fight ensues, things are going along, I guess, reasonably well, and Nenorta has a bow, and he, he draws back the arrow, uh, puts an arrow and draws back the bow, and when he fires, Anzu sees it coming, and he says, while holding the Tablet of Destinies, um, reed, which is what the arrow was made out of, go back to your reed bed. And the arrow has no choice uh, because Anzu holds the Tablet of Destinies. The arrow turns around and goes back. So Ninorta can't, you know, can't, uh, can't get him. He controls the elements. So Ninorta loses round one, essentially. Well, he's distraught and he takes his trusty mace is one of his uh, special weapons, and it's a cool talking mace named Shar Or, which in Sumerian is one who levels uh, myriads, thousands, whatever. And uh, <laughs> he says to the mace, Shar Or, go get some advice for me from Enki, uh, from Ea. So the mace travels and comes to Ea, and Ea comes up with this great plan which um, uh, 
I won't, I won't reveal it now. I'll wait uh, to keep some suspense built. And uh, the, the mace comes back and says, um, so Nenorta, here's the plan. This is what I has come up with. Nenorta likes it. He works himself up into a frenzy again. And he goes back and fights with Anzu. During the fight, according to the plan, he wears Anzu out, makes him tired, so much so that he lowers his wings. And when Anzu lowers his wings, Nenorta cuts off some of his feathers. Which may seem strange. When he cuts off his feathers, Anzu looks at them sort of floating around around him and he says, Wing, I mean uh, feathers, return to me. Well, now, if you think about the makeup of an arrow, it has little feathers at the back, right, to guide its flight. Well, <clears throat> Ninorta uh, draws back an arrow and fires it. And when he does, that's when Anzu is saying, feathers, return to me. Talking about the feathers floating around. Well, because the Tablet of Destinies controls the elements, it brings every feather back to him, including the arrow. And so by trickery, essentially, um, Ninorta is able to defeat, defeat Anzu. And remember, this is going to come up later, the idea was Ea's, which makes sense. He's the god of wisdom. He's the god of strategy. So Anzu is killed, and the text says, The wind bore Anzu's wing feathers as a sign of his glad tidings. So the, the wind takes the feathers of Anzu, back to the other gods as a sign that Anzu's been defeated. But that's a very specific phrase. The wind bore Anzu's wing feathers as a sign of his glad tidings. Keep that in mind. Well, Enlil, knowing that Anzu has been defeated, sends a messenger, Burdu, to speak to Ninorta and says, hey, come on back. We're gonna, the gods are gonna exalt you, throw a big party, it's gonna be great. And Ninorta says, why surrender the trappings of kingship? My utterance has become like that of the king of the gods. I will not return the Tablet of Destinies. Bum, bum, bum. So the whole point of him going out there was to kill Anzu to get the Tablet of Destinies back for Enlil. Nothing's doing. Um, he says, at least at this point in the text, I'm not returning it. Because my utterance, my words, my speech have become like the king of the gods. Now, <clears throat> the text sort of breaks a little. It's fragmentary at, that, at this, this, the next section, so we're not really sure if Ninorta does eventually relent and return the Tablet of Destinies to Enlil. But it's something that we want to keep in mind. We're not sure. There, there seems to be some evidence in, uh, in other texts that might indicate that he gave it back, but it's certainly not certain. Certainly not certain. So, when the text does pick back up, clearly Ninorta is back, back home around the gods, and they say to him, O Ninorta, because you were valiant and slew mountains, you have made all enemies submit before your father Enlil. You have gained lordship, each and every divine authority. So, Ninorta gets what he has coming to him, and he is, you know, he gains lordship over the gods, and this is really the point of the text, right? It's the exaltation of Ninorta. And as the text ends, there's a long list of names, uh, different names that are used uh, to refer to Ninorta. So Ninorta is called such and such in this city, he's called this other name in this city, he's called this other name in this city, and so forth. So, that's the Anzu myth. Now, when we come to Enuma Elish, we see a very similar story. Now, of course, Enuma Elish is written later. We have, for example, a copy of the Anzu myth from the old Babylonian period. So, you know, maybe around the 18th century BCE. And we think that Enuma Elish was, was written end of the second millennium, beginning of the first, probably end of the second, but the earliest copies that we have are in the first. So it's a later text, and you can see that, as Lambert argued in 86, and as is clear, 
there's a deliberate there's a deliberate use of themes and phrases and really the storyline itself in many places of the Anzu myth here in this uh, story of Enuma Elish. So let's go through it. In the beginning, there's this primordial world, the two gods, uh, Apsu and Tiamat, they're water deities. They're mingling their waters together, so it's this primordial watery initial state. And from that primordial water, and the mingling of those waters together, the gods Lachmu and Lachamu are created, who then give birth to Anshar and Kishar, who gives who give birth to Anu, who gives birth to Nudimud or Ea. There's going to be a quiz. I always say that, don't I? There's not going to be a quiz later. You don't have to remember all these things for it to be important. But Ea ultimately gives birth to Marduk. So who do you have to remember here? You have to remember Anshar. Anshar is important. He's Anu's father. He's Ea's grandfather. And he's Marduk's great-grandfather. So there you go. Anshar in this story is going to feature as a really prominent god on the good guy's side. And uh, Tiamat and Apsu are going to ultimately feature on the bad side. So, okay. The gods were making noise, which really bothered Apsu. This is one of the themes that we see in Mesopotamian literature. Gods make noise, people make noise, and it makes the gods upset. They can't sleep. Sorry, I shouldn't roll my eyes like that. Anyhow, Apsu says, I want to kill all the gods that are making all this noise. Well, Tiamat, who has given birth to them, says, give me a break. You can't just kill them. Just grin and bear it, right? Like when your kid's crying. Just grin and bear it. I don't know how Megan's been doing it. Anyhow, for those of you that have been uh, following Megan, it doesn't matter. Oliver is, a, is our four-month-old, and he's just... He's a great kid, obviously. He's amazing, but he cries a lot. So, anyhow, moving on. So, Tiamat says, put up with it. <clears throat> well, Apsu's vizier, Mumu, some great names, says that, no, Apsu, you should kill him. Let, or kill them. Let's let's kill him. So, Apsu's really excited. He's going to kill these gods uh, against Tiamat's um, decision. Well, Ea finds out about it, and Ea, being the god of wisdom, figures out a way, a strategy, and he implements it, kills Apsu, captures Mumu, and takes over Apsu's domain, the watery domain, the Abzu. And Ea and his wife Damkina live down there, and they give birth to Marduk. While Anu, who is Marduk's grandfather, really loves him and creates these four winds, W-I-N-D-S, for him to play with. So Marduk is playing with the winds, and because Tiamat is a water goddess, um, the winds are roiling her, the text says, and all the, the this big group of gods is becoming disturbed because of all the movement and the noise and whatever. And so the gods can't sleep, and they complain to Tiamat. And Tiamat says, all right, fine, we're going to kill this group of gods to stop the noise. So, as part of her plan, she creates these 11 monsters. She promotes this god, Kingu, to be the her spouse, her partner, whatever, and to hold kingship along with da -da -da -da, the Tablet of Destinies. So, Kingu is holding the Tablet of Destinies. This is important in the text. Well, <clears throat> Ea hears about Tiamat's battle plans and is terrified. He goes to his grandfather, Anshar, and says, what are we going to do? Well, Anshar is really upset with Ea because Ea is the one that sort of set all this stuff in motion. So Ea moves to, he's going to go out and fight Tiamat himself. And he gets out there and goes, uh, I ain't doing that. Turns around and says, she's, a, she's monstrous. She's un Nobody can defeat her. So then Anshar says to his son, Anu, hey, go out there and beat Tiamat. 
Anu starts to go out, comes back scared, says the same thing. Well, this really makes Anshar upset. And Anshar says, fine, I'm not going to ask anybody else to go do this. Well, because Anshar is upset, Aya decides he's going to go to Marduk. And Marduk, Anshar likes Marduk. And he says to Marduk, look, go visit him, calm his heart down. Well, Marduk goes to visit him and volunteers to go fight Tiamat. But, he says, if I do it, I want to be made the supreme god. So, there's a long section of the text where the gods all convene and they drink and they eat and they all decide, yep, we're going to make Marduk the supreme deity. So, Marduk gets all his stuff ready. He um, gets all his battle equipment together has a net, has a mace, has the winds, the seven the seven ill winds, the seven winds. And he approaches. Now it's interesting, we'll talk about this in a minute, but Kingu, as uh, Kingu and Tiamat are aligned, you know, the 11 monsters are there as well. But as Marduk approaches in his fury, Kingu is struck confused. Now, he's got the Tablet of Destinies, right? He's, he should be, like, the baddest guy on the block. Well, he's just, before Marduk even gets there, he's just confused, and he's rendered completely useless in the battle. So now, it's just Marduk and Tiamat. The 11 monsters don't really figure in. Excuse me. Well, Marduk takes this net of his, excuse me, and encircles Tiamat with it. And while he does that, he takes one of these great winds and blows it into her mouth. And it fills her stomach up, and she expands and expands. She can't close her mouth, and he takes an arrow and shoots it through her belly. And she explodes, and she dies. The uh, other rebel gods are cast into um, Marduk's net, and the Tablet of Destinies is taken from Kingu. So... Kingu's done nothing. He's like a lame duck. And the Tablet of Destinies is taken from him. Then the text says, The Lord trampled upon the frame of Tiamat. With his merciless mace, he crushed her skull. He cut open the arteries of her blood. He let the north wind bear it, the blood, away as glad tidings. Interesting, isn't it? Of course, Lambert pointed this out back in 86. But this phrase, this specific phrase is being used. We'll talk about it again in a minute. He uses Tiamat's body to create heaven and earth. He organizes the world. Marduk is elevated to the king of the gods, status of the king of the gods. He builds the city of Babylon. I know I'm moving through this quickly. but Now, at this point, he tells Ea this idea about creating mankind. And Ea does it using Kingu's blood um, to create mankind. Marduk then organizes the other gods into their places in the universe, and destinies are then decreed for Marduk. And at the end of the text, there are the 50 names of Marduk. Same sort of thing that happened in the Anzu myth. So you can see these two texts are very, very similar. Enemy presents itself in the beginning of the text. People, gods try to go out to fight it. They can't. They're too scared. And one god steps up and goes out and defeats it and then is exalted. Okay. So what are the similarities? What did Lambert uh, initially point out, and again, I I may add a few more, that shows that these two texts, that that Enuma Elish is definitely borrowing, uh, rewriting in a sense, the Anzu myth? Well, we talked about the bearing winds. Right, so in the Anzu myth, let the winds bear off his wing feathers as glad tidings to the Acor, to your father. In Enuma Elish, let the winds bear her blood away as glad tidings. So, one makes sense, right? The wind bearing off feathers, that makes sense. Feathers would be carried by the wind. But blood, it's a weird thing to have carried off. So it's clearly taking this phrase this sentence and pulling it in and just 
changing the situa changing it to fit the situation, but it's a clear recitation of this, a clear borrowing of this phrase or this sentence. Uh, the seven winds. So Anzu, in the Anzu myth, let your seven ill winds go up to the mountain. Well, in Enuma Elish, he released the winds that he had made, the seven of them. The bow. In the Anzu myth, ready your bow, let the lightning shafts fly from it. In Enuma Elish, he made the bow, appointed it his weapon. He mounted the arrow, set it on the string. Again, same weapon. The mace. In the Anzu myth, the Shar or you know, the special talking mace. In Enuma Elish, he took up the mace, held it in his right hand. Talking about Marduk. And he also uses it to crush Tiamat's skull. This section about the names at the end of the text. At the end of the Anzu myth, they called your name such and such in this city. Listed them on down. In Enuma Elish, the 50 names of Marduk. It's a very striking similarity. More subtle, perhaps, or indirect, would be his net, the net that Nenorten and Girsi uses. Now, you can see from other literary texts that he uses a net, uh, no question about it, but it's also depicted in artistic imagery, so in the Stele of the Vultures. Ningirsu Ninorta is holding a net with the enemies inside of it. And in Enuma Elish, the text says, then he made a net to enclose Tiamat with, and that's what he uses. And it's interesting, Lambert points this out, that a net is used to catch the water deity. It's kind of interesting. You wouldn't think that a net would be used to catch water, but it is. So again, taking an idea, bringing it into the text to make a connection back to Ninorta, but it's something that doesn't fit exactly. And also his chariot. Anzu is known for his chariot. Oh, sorry, not Anzu. Ninorta and Girsu, they're known for, known for the chariot. Uh, for example, in Ninorta's Return to Nippur. And in Enuma Elish, the Marduk has a storm chariot. So again, not as, uh, perhaps not as clear, but definitely there. Now, we've talked about the similarities so that the reader, when he looked at it, would know, oh, the person writing Enuma Elish is trying to pull from the Anzu myth. So I want to make sure I connect to the Anzu myth. But the differences perhaps are even more important. So where does the text where does the text differ? So the power and wisdom of Ea. In Enuma Elish, Ela Ela Ea is born very, very powerful. The text goes to great pains to say um, how powerful and wise Ea is. Outsmarts Apsu, for example, in the beginning. But this powerful, wise deity is terrified, too terrified to fight Tiamat. But of course, Marduk isn't. In addition, when we think about the creation of mankind, it's Marduk's idea, not Ea's, on how to do it. Now, Ea is still left to do the creating, so it doesn't take away the, the actual creation act from him. But the text says, he would tell his idea to Ea about creating mankind. That deed is beyond comprehension. By the artifices of Marduk did Nudimud, Ea, create. Finally, we've talked about in another video about the Apkalu, or the sages, that Ea is called the Apkal Eli, the Apkalu of the gods. Well, here in Enuma Elish, Marduk is referred to as Apkal Eli, the um, Apkalu of the sage of the gods. Sorry, I need to get some more sleep. Now, there is an extreme level of bravery and strength that's attributed to Marduk. In the Anzu myth, it's these minor deities are the ones that are called upon to go and fight the Anzu bird to get the Tablet of Destinies back. So Anu's son, Adad, Anunitum's son, Gira, 
and Ishtar's son Shara, in that order, are asked to, to go out and to fight, and of course each one says, no way, I can't do it. But in Enuma Elish, Anu himself, Ea himself, these deities, the main deities, are the ones that refuse to go. They're too scared to go. But Marduk volunteers to go. Remember in the Anzu myth, Ninurta sort of had to be convinced. Not Marduk, Marduk volunteers. So it's the differences are, I think, intentionally made here. Ninurta is initially thwarted against the Anzu, uh, the Anzu bird, right? He goes out, shoots the arrow, Tablet of Destinies turns it back. Not Marduk. Marduk doesn't get beaten at all. As a matter of fact, the one that held the Tablet of Destinies, Kingu, as we talked about, is rendered useless just by Marduk approaching. Right, so uh, Ninorta, were it not for the idea, the help of, of Ea, ostensibly Ninorta wouldn't have been able to defeat Anzu. It was only through trickery, through outsmarting him that he beat him, but not Marduk. Marduk nullifies, just takes Kingu out initially without really even doing anything. So the Tablet of Destinies really doesn't help him at all. And then finally, talking about the Tablet of Destinies, here's something that we're not 100% sure about, obviously, uh, but something that we can we need to consider. Ninorta, in the Anzu myth, is initially reticent, at least initially reticent, to return the Tablet of Destinies, right? He says, why should I surrender the trappings of kingship? And since the text is broken, we don't actually know for sure whether he did return it or not. We can, we can assume that he did. <clears throat> That's probably safest to do, but... It's possible that he didn't, but even if he did, there's this in initial uh, temptation, decision, whatever you want to call it, to not return it, which is significant, I think, because in Enuma Elish, Marduk returns it, um, and I think that maybe the reason that he does so is because he's so powerful without it. He doesn't even need it. Remember, he, he Kingu had it, and it didn't avail him at all. So Marduk is so strong that he beats somebody with the Tablet of Destinies really without even doing anything. So what do we make of this? Well, Enuma Elish certainly is a development of the Anzu myth, but the similarities may primarily be in place to draw attention to the differences between Ninorta and Marduk. Marduk is everything that Ninorta was and more. Wiser and more powerful than Ea, braver and mightier than Ninorta, and perhaps even strong enough to have no need for the Tablet of Destinies. This sort of intertextuality, this sort of comparison, influence, effect that one text has upon another is very important to take into consideration when you analyze these, text, these types of texts. Because without the Anzu myth to um, show us uh, or to uh, to show us what Enuma Elish is doing, we may not understand. We may not have understood some of the subtleties, or maybe the maybe even not subtleties. Some of the, the the theological purposes behind what Enuma Elish is doing, and that can also be true, and is often true of biblical texts. If we don't understand what's influencing the intertextuality between the biblical texts and the other ancient Near Eastern texts we can very easily miss the point of the text, the genre of the text, and really what the writer is trying to get across in the story that he's writing. Thanks.